Greetings to all of you, my dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends. And all of you are welcome to this new broadcasting of prayer, our deepest longing. This is your pastor, Yeti. Today we are in, in our reflection and study in chapter 4, practicing reflective prayer. So come with me in this first level, the aim of effective prayer. Private or effective prayer has many forms. Meditation, centering prayer, praying, the rosary, and devotional prayers of all kinds. But effective prayer has a single aim, to draw us and our loved ones into deeper intimacy with Christ. In the end, no matter its particular form, and even when it is done publicly or in a large group, all private and devotional prayer can be defined in this way. It is a prayer that tries in myriad ways to open us up in such a way that we can hear God say to us, I love you. So let me summarize it this way. You must try to pray so that in your prayer you open yourself in such a way that sometime, perhaps not today, but sometime you are able to hear God say to you, I love you. These words addressed to you by God are the most important words you will ever hear before uh, because before you hear them, nothing is ever completely right with you, but after you hear them, something will be right in your life at a very deep level. This might sound pious and sentimental. It is anything but that. Do not be put off by simplicity. The simpler something is, the harder it is to wrap our minds around it. <clears throat> and that is true of prayer. It's so simple that we rarely lay bare its essence. John's Gospel already makes that point. The Gospel of John structures itself very differently from the other Gospels. John has no infancy, narrative or early life of Jesus. In his Gospel we meet Jesus as an adult right on the first page. And the first words of Jesus' mouth are a question. What are you looking for? That question remains throughout the rest of the gospel as an undergrading, suggesting that beneath everything else, a certain search is forever going on. A lot of things are happening on the surface, but underneath there remain always the nagging, restless question. What are you looking for? Jesus answers that question explicitly only at the end of the Gospel, on the morning of the Resurrection. Mary Magdalene goes looking for him, carrying spices with which to embalm his dead body. Jesus meets her, alive and in no need of embalming, but she doesn't recognize him. Bewildered but sincere, she asked Jesus where she might find him. Jesus repeats for her the question with which she opened the gospel. What are you looking for? And then he answered it with deep reflection. Jesus pronounced her name, Mary. In the end, that's what we are looking for and most need. We need to hear God affectionately one to one saying our name. Martha, Joshua, Diane, 
Marie Christine. And Nels. Moreover, because prayer is meant to be a mutual thing, it is important that we respond in kind. Part of effective prayer is that we, too, one to one, with affection, at least occasionally say the same thing to God I love you. In all long term affectionate relationships, The partners occasionally have to prompt each other to hear expressions of affection and reverence. The relationship of prayer is no different. Come a step further with me, being bold in prayer. The classic definition of prayer tells us that prayer is raising mind and heart to God. In essence, that says it all. The problem is that we often raise our minds but not our hearts. Our prayer tends to be intellectual but not effective. And we tend to think of prayer more as a way of gaining insight than as a way of being touched in the heart. But ultimately, prayer is about love. It's about love, not the inside. It is meant to establish friendship. Friendship, as we know, is not as much a question of having insight into each other's lives as it is of mutual touching each other in affection and understanding. Friendship is, as John of the Cross puts it, is a question of attaining boldness with each other. When we have touched each other's lives deeply, we can be bold with each other. We can then ask each other for help, ask each other to be present without needing an excuse, or share our deepest feelings. Good friendship inspires boldness. The object of prayer is precisely to try to attain this kind of boldness with God. To try to reach a point where we are comfortable enough with God to ask for help. Just as we would trust a friend. But to reach this kind of trust we first must let God touch us in the heart and not just in inside. This means prayer is not so much a question of having beautiful thoughts about God as it is of feeling God's affection for us. Sadly, that is what we generally miss in prayer, the experience of God's affection. What is common in prayer is the tendency to talk to ourselves rather than to God. For example, when we are at prayer, we begin to have various feelings and insights. The almost automatic reaction is to begin to speak to ourselves about what's happening in us, seeing this like, this is wonderful, this scares me, I shouldn't be feeling this way, I can't wait to write this down. When this happens, we end up speaking to ourselves rather than to God. step further. Prayer as surrender. It's not easy to be centered, rooted, secure in who we are, able to give the world our best. More commonly, we find ourselves adrift, unsure of ourselves, with most of what's best in us still frustrated, buried, waiting for a better day. Too many things, it seems, conspire against us living out what's stressed what's trust us and best inside us. I mean, what's truest and best inside us. We'd like to be grounded be ourselves, have a clear direction in life, be free of compulsion, and live out more 
our dignity, goodness and creativity. But too many things push us the opposite way. Ideology, anger, bitterness, envy, restlessness, confusion, moral compromises, and the simple need to get by all pull us down. We end up giving into various compensations as substitutes for what we really want, and thus we quietly despair of ever embracing our dignity, talents, and solitude at any high level. Why doesn't it happen? It happens because we cannot stay steady in a churning sea without a good anchor. We cannot avoid giving into compensations unless what's highest in us is giving enough expression. And we cannot deal with the issues of finitude and, and, unless we have some transcendent focus. Unless we are anchored in something beyond the here and now. Chances are we will drone in the present moment. Jesus models the kind of prayer we need to cope with a world that goes mad at times, and with hearts prone to drink in that madness. The Gospels describe Jesus praying in different ways, but sometimes they simply say he turned his eyes toward heaven. The same expression is used of other great faith figures, Stephen, Paul, the early martyrs, and it's used of them precisely of those times when the forces of madness are threatening to kill them. When the world around them is going mad, they turn their eyes toward heaven. What made Jesus different and what makes any prayer for person different is not superior with power, less fiery emotions, monastic withdrawal from the temptations of the world, or intellectual insight. Prayer is not a question of insight, of being smarter than anyone else, nor or will, of being stronger than anyone else, nor of emotional restraint or sexual aloofness, of being less passionate than anyone else, nor of withdrawal of being less exposed to temptation than anyone else. Prayer is a question of unity and surrender, as simple as that, of uniting one's will with someone else and surrendering one's will to that other. Prayer is a desire to be in union with someone, especially in union with that other's will. Each of us needs to find our own will of doing this if we are to cope with the forces that threaten to drown us. It's not through study or willpower that we will rise above our moral aptitude, the endless practical demands of life, and the compensations we give into the coup. We will always be adrift until we, like Jesus, regularly turn our eyes toward heaven. Come with me a step further. Contemplative prayer. One of the great spiritual writers of our time was Thomas Merton, a Trappist monk. Merton, though, wasn't born in a monastery. He checkered past and a driving restless led him there. And what he was looking for was solitude, despite from a temperament that would not let him rest. His mother and father had been artists, and Merton inherited from them those qualities that makes for a good artist huge talent, a fertile imagination, and a punishing restlessness. By the time he was 25, he was poised professionally to the great things, but this person's life was a mess. More than that, he was dying, literally, because he couldn't slow down, anchor himself in everyday life, and simply rest. Restlessness was beating him up like a playground bully. 
he wasn't eating properly or sleeping regularly, and he had no redeeming rhythm or routine to his life. He was spending his nights in jazz clubs, living on cigarettes and alcohol, and nursing a stomach ulcer. His health was deteriorating dangerously, spiritually and morally. He was searching sincerely and even desperately for someone or something to commit himself to. But even as he flirted with faith and church, his restlessness and bad habits made it difficult for him to commit to anything in a consistent way. There's an infamous story told of how he used to hang around Catherine Dorothy's early Madonna house community in New York, until Catherine one day told him to stay away because he was a bad influence. His honesty eventually paid off, and Morton took the plunge of fate, leaving New York career and friends behind. He entered the Trappist Abbey in Kentucky. He did it, in his own words, to save his life, having realized that, unless he did something as radical as this, he would die soon. He did it too, to search for God and to find something that had eluded him all of his life, simple rest. Initially, the monastery did for him what he had hoped for. It gave him a sense of God's presence, a clear direction in life, and a calm body and spirit. He went through a burst of first fervor that he shared with the world in his classic autobiography, The Seven Touré Mountain, a story mountain. But restlessness, as we know, cannot be turned on and off like a water tap. It seeps through even monastery doors. Merton's restlessness returned, but now, as a monk, Merton had an answer for it. He answered, contemplative prayer, solitude. Contemplative prayer is the answer to restlessness, but Merton learned that it is not an easy thing, not a technique you master it, at a weekend seminar. During the last years of his life, living as a hermit, he tried to explore more deeply what it meant to live in a solitude and contemplat contemplation. What he eventually learned and recorded in his diaries during those years surprised him. Contemplation, he found out, is not some alerted form of consciousness, nor a blank consciousness imped empty it of all thoughts and feeling, nor even a consciousness that empties itself of everything except thoughts and feelings about God. And solitude, he came to realize, is not something we attain once and for all. We don't divide our lives in two, before and after. We have found solitude. Rather, our hours and our days are divided between those times when we are more in solitude and those times we are more caught up in the distractions of our work and the heartache of our restlessness. Contemplation is not, first and foremost, a technique for prayer. Sometimes prayer, especially centering prayer, can help us find it. But contemplation is something more. It's a way of being present to what's really inside our own experience. We are in solitude, in contemplation, in prayer, when we feel the warmth of a blanket, taste the flavor of coffee, share love and friendship, and perform the everyday task of our lives so as the perceives in them that our lives aren't little or anonymous or unimportant. But that's what timeless and eternal is in the, order, in the ordinary of our lives.
my dear ones. What a reflection. It's very strong. But we cannot run away from our reality. We have to face our own reality. <clears throat> And if we don't accept our reality, I think we have missed the whole point of our own life. In everything we do and everything we feel, yeah, we run away from it. When we don't like it, it will always come back to us. We heard about the life of Thomas Merton and what he had to do. And I think probably in the beginning he was running away from it. And then he faced it. Prayer is connection. It's relationship. It's living a life, a contemplative life in every moment. Wherever we are, whatever we do, whatever we touch, is a prayer moment. It's coming in the presence, in our awareness of our own reality and our life, in the presence of God who is always there. Don't run away from your reality. And we always have a choice. Blessings to all of you, my dear ones. This is your pastor, Yadi. I love you guys. Bye.